Okay. I can't actually see any of you, but uh, you'll believe me that I'm very happy uh, to be here again. Um, my name is Guy. I'll do a proper introduction in a moment. I just want to say something about uh, this deck, it's, uh, somewhat personal. Um, I usually, when I give talks, I do a lot of technical talks like exploitation, artificial intelligence, and stuff like that. And uh, those are very technical, very math-oriented talks because this is my background. However, uh, I wanted to do this talk because of a couple of conversations that I've had in the past, uh, I don't know, probably a year or so, about uh, research teams and the place of research teams in uh, larger organizations. And, no, I haven't touched anything, okay. So the scope of this talk would be more of like, how does managing a research team looks like in a big organization? Big might be a relative word. And uh, if you are a manager of such a team or you're looking or thinking about how to manage such a team, I hope that some of those nuggets would be very helpful to you. But also if you're a security researcher in one of those teams, I think that this talk can uh, help you understand the way that uh, the management thinks about research teams and where you can find yourself the most valuable, the best pivot for your own InfoSec security, uh, for your own information security career. So, first of all, hi, I'm Guy, Guy Barnack again. I'm not expecting anyone to actually know how to spell it. Um, I talk a lot, I like it, so I travel and I speak in many different conferences. I just came back from Vegas where I gave two technical talks, one on Linux hardening, the other about how to accelerate exploitation using uh, machine learning. And uh, today I'm going to talk more about uh, managing security research teams. Um, I've been a security researcher for many, many years, and I've transitioned into management roles about 10 years ago. Um, I've been in medium-sized organizations, like 4,500 people managing uh, security teams, but also for very large corporations. The latest have been uh, Cisco and Intel. So both are 70K plus uh, uh, people in the org. So my perspective on this has uh, been from both sides of the table, but also from the way that you scale up a very small research team, and also when you transition to a role where this research team already exists, and how to actually uh, drive the most from that situation. Um, I'm very biased, this is my own experience. I'm very happy to share my own experience, but it might uh, be different in other places. Not everything translates well even here in the UK versus Israel, where I'm from, but also from the United States to other places. But uh, try to listen to everything they say with a grain of salt, ask questions, and I'd be happy to share uh, whatever information that I have. <sighs> Security research teams. There are so many definitions. So you might be a pen tester, you might be a malware researcher, you might be a vulnerability uh, uh, or exploiter, you might be a threat hunter, all of those come into the same kind of grouping called security research teams. Some of them are more product focused, some of them are more service or uh, infrastructure focused, some of them are uh, looking in how to uh, break anything, some of them are looking how to break specific things. But in the end, most of them have very similar cultures, very similar methodologies to the way that they work. I'm not trying to uh, differentiate or disrespect any of those teams. My background is more in the lower part of this uh, um, list here. I've been a red teamer. I've uh, mainly done uh, low-level exploitation, uh, firmware level stuff. Uh, uh, I've, as I said, I've worked at Intel. Uh, but I've also uh, worked a lot with the teams that are on the other side, even on the blue side. And that brings me to something that's often missing in many of the conversation and really shapes the way that the other people in the org, even other people in IT who are our partners, look at research team. And that is that we often forget that the blue team has to win. Finding exploit is a lot of fun. Building the exploit is cool. You get a lot of creds, you get a CVE, you get to speak at conferences you really haven't moved the needle for the organization by doing that. The only way that you move the needle to organization is if you went over and helped the blue team to defend against this exploit, against this kind of attack. And if you're unable to mitigate this kind of attack, you haven't brought any real value to the conversation. Finding the issue is one thing, fixing it is something completely different. One of the things that I was very adamant with all of my teams over the years was 
that finding the issue is only one thing, but then you have to work with the developers, you have to work with the architects to make sure that they understand the root cause and help them fix the issue and then test that they actually fix the issue. It's not necessarily the same thing. And sometimes this gets lost. It gets lost in the conversation with our mad dash to run after the next kind of vulnerability, the next kind of uh, uh, new piece of uh, PR coming out. Exploiting isn't everything. Moving the needle is. So one of the, I want to share an example here. One of the teams that I was leading was very product focused. And here we got into kind of a, a, I would say like a bad spot, like a problematic spot, because to, to bring value, you want to be able to influence the development of the product, whatever the product is, in a timely manner to actually uh, uh, actuate some effect. And if you're not doing that, then you haven't really made a change. So on the one hand, you have to wait until the product is ready for you to do some sort of attack on it, because if it's still being written, or if it's not even uh, alpha or beta ready, you have nothing to work with. On the other hand, if you're waiting until you have something to work with and you go to the development teams or the architecture team and tell them, look, I found like this list of issues, say, okay, it's too late, I'm already shipping this version next week. So finding that sweet spot of working with those teams, getting them the information that they need in order to influence their decisions to change the way that they're building the product is a very delicate balance. And you have to find a way to work together with those teams so they will tell you when is the best uh, time to step in and work on their product. And it's a balancing act because you have other jobs to do as well. But if you're not going to hit that timing right, you will not be able to move the needle. You will not make an effect. Different teams have different focus, and you have to take that in mind when you're talking to those teams. If you're talking with a, a blue team, IT team that really wants to protect the organization against threat, it's a completely different conversation with them working with red teams that are trying to find each and any uh, method available to any outside attacker in order to access the assets or affect the way that the product is working. Those are different mindsets, different philosophies. And that means that when you're building your approach, when you're trying to get them on your, uh, on your team and influence the way that they are working, you have to take different approaches. And I will discuss some of them later. Being a manager, and I'm going to skim over these slides because I think they're somewhat generic, but I have been on teams where they actually didn't know this. A manager, most the core of the responsibility of the manager is to define the mission, is to say to the team, what are we going to do? What are we working on? It's just not handing out tasks, but actually tying the vision together that everybody's working and pulling together in the right direction. It's not so easy for research teams. When everybody's working on the product and you have, I don't know, a Jira or uh, something similar to that, or an agile process and everybody's working on their user stories, it's very visible that if you're working on something that's toward the product or not. If you're working on a research team and you have two team members working on something and another working on a POC and the third one is researching a new piece of uh, 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 technology that just came out, how do you pull everyone together and working on the same thing? It's not an easy problem to solve. Also, as a manager, you have to make sure that what your people are working on actually aligns with the business need. And this is something that I've, I've talked to so many teams that actually forgot this part. And that is doing research is nice. Doing research for the name of research probably won't fly for long in most organizations. I love Project Zero. I really do. I have friends working in Project Zero. And they have the mandate and the budget from management to do what they do. But they don't go around unchecked, looking at anything and everything, whatever they fancy. They have a, a work plan, they have focus areas, they decide ahead of time where are they going to look at and what kind of projects they're going to approach. They're not running around randomly attacking stuff. And this is like the gold standard. On the other hand, I've talked to a research team where, yeah, I'm researching this stuff on automotive, and another team member is doing something on avionics, and another team member is just doing some on malware. The company does none of those domains. I agree that you can learn from anything, but you actually have to align what your team is doing to something that serves the business. Because if you don't, you're going to have a very difficult budget conversation at the end of the year. Your team is everything. 
you are as good as your team. Some managers think that because they are the managers or they're on the management side, they get like special bonus points for being managers. If anything, you get deducted bonus points for being a manager. You have to think about how to push your team forward, how to uh, make their results visible to management, to other people, to make it clear that their work has value. This is one of the roles of you as a manager, sometimes overlooked. Getting people on your team working together, especially in the scene of uh, uh, security researchers, is difficult. This is like a rugged bunch of individuals, everyone's an anarchist, nobody believes anyone, and everyone is paranoid. And then they want a job, and they need to work together towards a common goal. Not so easy handling this uh, 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 kind of, uh, I don't know if it translates to English, herding cats. So it's just kind of like trying to get all of those cats in the single file walking in the same direction. It's doable, but it's not that easy. On the other hand, if you're not going to do that, you won't have a team. So you have to be prepared and to think about your strategy ahead of time of how are you going to do that. When I got uh, the responsibility for my first team, that was like, I don't know, 11 years ago, something like that, my manager at the time told me, we have a bunch of somewhat eccentric people. How are you going to handle them? Which was very clear that he was not handling them. And I told him, well, I don't know. I'll work with them and I'll find out what eccentricities they have and see what I can work with and what I have to work without. And when I got to know the team, I knew, uh, I learned how to let go of some stuff, but really bring down on other stuff. And that really helped because, let's be honest, most security researchers have their pet peeves. I had a researcher that vehemently, even violently, refused to work on anything other than Vim. Why? There are other tools out there? No, this was religiously enforced by him. He would only work inside VI, maybe Vim, on good days. Okay, we can work with that. I, I'm not forcing anyone what kind of tooling he needs to use, but if he wants to work on the team, he needs to work with the same tools as the team. Write your own plugin to make it work inside Vim. I don't care. So you can make those balances. You can make this work if you get prepared ahead of time. But if you don't, if you're trying to work with them and say, I'm the boss, this is what I've said, this has to happen, you will not have a team for very long. Another thing that's very difficult for managers, specifically what I've seen in security research managers, is that, at least in my experience, 99% of them came from a security researcher background. That means that they have technical proficiency and they have at least uh, an aura of sorts of some sort of technical capability. And then they got thrust into management. Maybe they were the best on their team. Maybe they were the most available to it. Maybe they had a flair for managing people. Somewhere in the back of their mind, they're still with security researchers. I am still a security researcher, not an active one, not even a good one anymore. But I still think of myself as a security researcher, but I'm also a manager. And when you go into management, you have to accept that you're no longer the hands-on type of contributor. You have other important things to do, and you can't do the research yourself. That's why you have a team, and that's why you have to show the team that you are trusting them, that you are leading them, but you're not trying to take their place. You can't be the only one to speak at Black Hat. Other people need to speak as well. This also uh, affects training decisions. I could probably at the, at the time do the training for my team and teach everybody on my team almost every aspect of the job. If I would have done that, that would have been a very bad decision. <laughs> Not because I can't do it, but because it shouldn't be me to do that. Your best bet is to find people on your team and empower them. Give them that responsibility, oversee it. Make sure that they grow from that experience and that they take on new responsibilities and take that responsibilities off of your backs. Power and politics is always an issue in almost, well, I haven't been in an organization where it wasn't uh, a major driver for decisions, but understanding the politics behind them and in, to some degree shielding 
your team from those politics is the responsibility of the manager. Good managers are able to dance between two different poles. The first one would be, I want to make sure that my team is completely isolated from corporate bullshit. On the other hand, I want my team to be uh, open and transparent about everything that's happening, even if it's going to stress them out and uh, give them the wrong idea of what's gonna happen. As a manager, you have perspectives that they don't have. And they are looking to you to share that perspective. Sometimes you can, sometimes you don't. But you have to be as open and transparent as you can. You will often find that even in large, well, it's very common in large corporates, but also in smaller corporates, that there are other teams working on similar things, even on exactly the same things that you're working on. So ignoring the blatant uh, misuse of resources here, this is something that I at least found to be pretty common. Uh, at the time when I was working for Cisco, I tried to do uh, like an enumer enumeration, how many different teams are working in the IoT space. At the time, which was like seven years ago, seven, eight years ago, uh, IoT was relatively new. It was not like something today very uh, orderly. Uh, everybody was doing something. And then we're like between five to seven different security research teams focusing on IoT. How, how, why would this happen? Why should it happen? And the answer to that is mainly politics, because one of the high-level managers, the group managers or something like that said, look, IoT is a new and sexy field. We should have someone looking into it. And then you have like five of those managers, and each of them has its own group looking into it. And you can see it again and again. It happened with blockchain, it happened with machine learning, it happened with IoT, and it happened with any kind of new buzzwords coming around, and new teams will spring up like uh, fresh mushrooms after the rain. This causes strife. This causes ego issues. This causes a lot of mistrust between teams that all, they all feel that they're competing for the same things. Both as a team member and as a manager, you have to be aware that this happens, and you have to think about how to make sure that your core responsibilities as a research team are kept intact and not to be dragged away after the newest buzzword that six months to one year later dies out and the team with it. So you have to invest your power strategically and realize that some things are transient and not everything needs to be uh, sought after so vehemently. Ego is a big problem in management, in people, in humans in general. Whenever ego comes into the room, someone comes out suffering. You can't leave ego out of the room, even though many people say that you can or you should. If you will keep your ego out of the room, somebody else will bring his ego in the room. You have to be prepared for it. There are other research teams out there, there are other research managers out there, and some of them will put their ego first. Think about what are you going to do in that position? How are you going to react? Thinking about this before it happens and having a, a planned response ready will really better your position in the organization and in general lead for a better team, both internally and externally. Skip this one, okay. So how would you do that? I had uh, preparing for this uh, slide deck, I had conversations, something like 12 different research teams across the board. As many of you know, Israel is a hub for security technology. I have uh, friends in many, many, many different security companies. Most of them are in the same WhatsApp group. So I kind of uh, asked around and said, okay, this is the, the main issues that I see. What do you feel about that? How, how would you tackle this? And we had a lot, of, a lot of lively discussions around how do we actually manage security research teams? And I think that the number one issue that came up is the most important for many different reasons is that if you're not clear or you don't have very clear guidance about what you're actually researching, what the research question is and who does what and why and when to stop the research, that leads to a very bad research team experience. On the other hand, if you have a manager that clearly defines what you're, look, what you're going after, what you're looking for, and time boxes it, don't invest more than two weeks around that, and let's have another discussion then. Or whenever you reach to that point, that's done. I don't need a POC. Just make sure that you can show that this happened. Get that address. You got that address? Fine. Stop there. If you have a very 
clear definition of what you're going to do, when you're going to achieve it, how it looks like when you achieve it, and when you're going to stop, the research team as a whole benefits because they can affect their will, their resources, their time, their effort in a very coordinated and a very focused way. But for every team that doesn't have this, oh, thank you. For every team that doesn't have this, you get a disarray. You get people getting confused. You get people investigating something completely irrelevant for a very long period of time. I've heard examples like someone on my team spent a month working on a POC for something that's completely stupid and irrelevant. Like, I can exploit this refrigerator now through, that, uh, through its PLE stack, and I can make it uh, pop out three ice cubes instead of two ice cubes. That's a very nice POC, very but difficult to bring the refrigerator on stage, but at least you can make a video. But have you really done anything useful? If the manager for that team, the team leader for that team would have said, make sure you have code execution, stop there, I'm happy with code execution on the device, he wouldn't spend so much time building a, a, an irrelevant POC. I'm not dissing POC, I'll talk about them later. They have value, but you have to like focus on what's the right value for POCs. Building the right research question helps the people who are working on that research question focus, but also to get focused help from others. So when they have a very clear definition of what they're working on and why, and they get stuck, they can go to another team member, another team entirely, and ask for help because they know what they're looking for and they know what's irrelevant. But if you give them something general like hack this refrigerator, you get a lot of kind of different results. If you give them something specific like, I want to make sure that nobody can uh, uh, access the Twitter credentials stored on this uh, refrigerator, that gives a lot more focus to what they're trying to do. Being a manager does not uh, discourage you from being a technical person. You have to be a technical person to manage security researchers. At least that has been my experience. For every research team that I heard of that they got a non-technical manager, either the managers left or the team dispersed. It doesn't work well. But on the other hand, being a technical person does not mean that you have to do everything hands-on, which I just talked about earlier. Your job is to understand what's wrong and how to fix it. When you're working with your team and you see that they spend a disordinate amount of time finding tickets in Jira, well, nobody likes Jira, but you can write some scripts to automate it. If you see that most of their issues come from working with a different team member, some cross-team uh, collaboration, something like that, and they're spending lots of time in meetings and stuff like that, step in, separate them, find a better, a better solution to, do, to make that work. You need to be the voice for your team to make sure that nobody is having a painful experience doing what they need to do. If they do, they either walk around it, that's what we do, we'll walk around, uh, find workarounds around those issues, or we'll probably ignore them completely and something will explode in our faces later. So you have to be really on point, understand what the team does and how to help them do their team, uh, do their job better. Research teams don't work in a vacuum. Well, they often don't work in a vacuum. And if you want to make the most from your team and to make sure that your team really influences the company as a whole, show the other stakeholders, your peers, your colleagues, what the security research team can do for them. Not just as a, a, a leaf, a fig leaf to protect the organization, but something that can actually help them in what they're doing. And I'll give some examples of that later on how to show ROI for research teams. As a manager, you also have, some, have to make some tough calls. This is your purview, it's your turf. Should you even be responsible for active research? It's a question that comes up in almost any conversation that they have in any, with any research manager. Should the research managers be, even be responsible for active participation? Should they be hands-on? And this is something that you should decide and the team should know ahead of time. Nobody likes a manager that comes in and pops in, oh, give me the keyboard, I'll show you how it's done. Even if you know how it's done, even if you've done that 300 times before, 
It's better to give people the opportunity to learn and to do that on their own and learn and grow over time than you stepping in and doing it for them. Another thing is, is that you need to think about the future, part of your role as a manager. What would happen in a year from now when person X leaves the company? Do you have someone else to step in and fill in his shoes? Maybe she will leave for a better proposition. Do you know someone that can step in and take over her responsibilities? And if the answer is no, this is a very senior person, he knows everything, we trust him completely, you're in a bad position. You need to think about how to get out of that bad position. Maybe find other team members that can take some of those responsibilities so you'll have a backup. And maybe you need to think about what would happen if you leave the organization. Everybody has a replacement, but have you made the ground to have a replacement from your team? Or would you have someone dropped from outside for your team? Think about these kinds of uh, issues ahead of time and build your pipeline. Make sure that you have people ready at different stages. Juniors turning into seniors, seniors transition to leadership roles, not necessarily management, but transition to other kinds of fair roles. Make sure that there is a, let's say, a, a, an employment horizon for people on your team. They're not just coming to be a security researcher for two years or three years and then that's it. You have to make sure that they have a career progression. It's not a bad word to have a career. We just want to have a, our career in InfoSec. We need to think about our careers in that uh, kind of lens. Sometimes people are not the right fit for your team. I've had that happen multiple times. It takes time to identify that the issue, the core issue, the root cause, is that you have the wrong people on your team. It might be a single person, might be two persons, and it might be the right thing to do is to transition them to a different team and hire new people instead. It might be a culture issue. It might be uh, um, the way that they work with other people. Uh, Somil gave uh, an example just uh, an hour ago about the bad apples. Well, nobody wants to work with a bad apple. And if you can build a better culture by getting the right apples, getting the fresh apples in your barrel, then you should focus on that. This will big, bring better results for your entire team than just uh, um, condoning actions and behaviors from bad apples. Sometimes you have to, and I'll talk to that in the end. Some of the research managers that I know try to like walk away from hiring. So hiring is somebody else's problem. Let me know when you need the technical part of it being done. I'll ask the technical question, someone else handle everything else. It's wrong. I believe it's wrong. I think that as a manager, you have to be involved in the hiring process along the entire, uh, the entire stack. You have to be part of the sourcing, you have to be part of the interview, you have to be part of the decision, and you have to be part of the um, transition that the employee does when he gets into the organization. A small piece of statistic that I heard from uh, Google, from uh, Harvard Business Review. Now we just, okay, I'm live. So they did a study, and the single most uh, effective factor to uh, try to determine if someone is going to be good or successful after three months, I found it very surprising, was that the manager, the hiring manager, would meet them on their first day. So to me, it was like a blown out statistics. What do you mean? So some managers don't meet the employees on the first day when they get hired? And apparently it was like in 30% of the cases, the hiring manager was very busy. He had meetings, he was off-site, he was somewhere else, and so he uh, delegated it to someone else. And when that manager is delegating responsibility, those people that were hired onto the team felt like nobody cares about us. We're just another cog in the machine, we're just another screw. 
when the manager was there to greet them, to walk them around, to show them where they're going to sit, to show them the keyboard, the toilets, the kitchen, they felt like, okay, we're on board, we're on board into a team, into a family. We're going to be in the right place. And this sounds like a very small thing to do, meet your employees on, your, on their first day on the job. Apparently, it's not that obvious. Getting a team that's all seniors is very bad. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had that experience, <laughs> trying to manage a team of uh, six to eight seniors. It's a lot of fun, a lot of very technical discussions for about 20% of the time. And the other 80% of the time is being talked about other stuff other than technical, which is fine. They're all very good people. But now you have no pipeline. You have no way to grow the team. Senior people are by nature very independent. They know what they're doing. They're very proficient and very professional in what they do. But there are some roles or some stuff that they won't do. For some stuff, they're overkill to do. On the other hand, when you have a team of all juniors, and I had the misfortune of doing this once, <laughs> an experience that I don't care to repeat, you have a team that everybody is very enthusiastic and nobody knows what they're supposed to do. Which also, it's a good thing. Uh, I'm not disrespecting any of them, but it's a good thing, but you need someone to be there on site, on keyboard, to help them, to show them the ropes. If you're the manager, you're not that person. So when I built new teams from scratch, or when I received new teams, I always push to either get the, the, um, the racks, the hiring uh, uh, requirements, to open new headcount for junior people when I had a lot of seniors, or if I had a lot of junior people to say, okay, stop with the hiring the junior people, this doesn't help me, take two or three of those headcounts, pull them together and get me a senior. Because you can't run a show with eight junior people, and you definitely can't run a show with eight senior people. You have to think about your team for the long term. You have to think about your team in a broad sense and not just in making sure that all the day-to-day -day operations are being done. Building an incentive plan for uh, uh, junior people or for senior people or for any security researcher is usually dependent on what the researcher care about. I, this uh, photo was not selected randomly. I have a huge incentive to talk right here. London is my favorite city. But uh, uh, this is also happens quite often because you have uh, tools, you have uh, uh, opportunities when you're talking with security researchers that are not just the salary. The salary is not the only thing that uh, uh, counts. So a couple of things that really uh, help when you're talking with security researchers is showing them that there are other venues or other uh, methods to, well, drinking is one, but hopefully not the only thing. Uh, other things that they can do in your team that actually uh, they might not be able to do in other teams. So publishing work uh, is a difficult point. I'll, I'll give my own perspective on that. I worked for Intel, someone might have heard of that company, uh, for the past two and a half years. I left like three months ago. And it took me over a year to uh, get the approval process and the uh, marketing people, PR people, legal people, HR people, everybody aligned properly so I would have permission to go and talk. And it wasn't because anybody was thinking, oh, you shouldn't talk about that subject, it's very risky, we're very paranoid. It's more like, we haven't encountered anyone who actually wanted to speak. How would we go about this? We have no process. So, yeah, that's another way, but that won't last for long. Hitting them really clears out the senses, but doesn't affect change for a longer period of time. So it, you can get it done, and I'd be happy to bring uh, to help you with some tips on how to do that. But it also really helped with getting people on my team, because once the people, uh, uh, other people heard that my team is out there presenting, talking, and going to conferences, they said, oh, I want to be part of that team. This is the stuff that I care about. I want to do that. This is a very marginal cost to you as a manager, allowing or sending your people to speak at conferences. It's a very cheap uh, uh, incentive to include in the package. Side research is also very important. Allowing your people to grow and enhance their skills is a benefit to you as an employer. Doing, th doing so on a side research that's actually beneficial for the business is good for you as well. Uh, Google has the, or at least had the 20% rule, 
Most of the companies can't afford one day a week where somebody works on something that they care about. But find a side, a side project that everybody on the team can care about and work on it, especially if you have some downtime. Uh, sending people to conferences is the way that we, as security professionals, really learn and improve our uh, abilities. Some of that actually comes from listening to talks, probably a very small percentage of that. Most of that comes from attending those conferences and talking to other people and getting new views and hearing about new tool sets and new frameworks. This is actually what happens at conferences. And it's a very difficult sell when you go into corporate and say, I really have to go to that conference and talk to people. They don't get it, but you can go to them and say, I really have to go to that conference and do that workshop and do that training and uh, go to other sponsors and uh, vendors and see what they're doing and to better enrich my own intelligent feeds on, uh, on how stuff is done. They can relate to that. So change your messaging, the same thing still happens. If other people know that your team is part of the community, contributing to the community, they would love coming working for your team, even if a different team is offering more money. And that's also uh, very uh, strongly correlated to retaining those people. Okay. Um, I'll try to hustle a bit. Um, another thing that really uh, comes about pretty often in conversation about security research teams is how do you show the organization the return on investment? I haven't encountered, well, I encountered one, so uh, I almost never encountered a security research team that was tied to a PNL center, to a profit and loss center. Most security research teams are part of a, some sort of research division where they get a budget, but they don't have revenue. So in the corporate world, that means that they are a cost center. They cost money to operate. They're not getting any money from operating that piece of the business. So whenever you have budget conversation, headcount conversations, anything with someone else in the management chain in the uh, in the overall corporate world, they'll say, okay, but you're just costing me money. Show me what's your value. Understanding how they think about value and thinking about some of these ideas will help you be better positioned for those conversations. And you have to be ready for those conversations because they will happen. The first thing is that whatever you're working on should be aligned with what the business is working on. And aligned is not something like flimsy, like uh, we are working on IoT, so I'll work on IoT as well. You have to show that what you're working, if it's successful, if you find whatever you're looking for, or if you show that you're not able to find what you're looking for, has actual business value. And you get that from talking to the business people who actually care about their product. And you go to them and say, oh, you have a, a web-facing product, and I can show you that if you use this library, then a hacker can come in and take all of our uh, uh, customers' data. That's pretty bad. He understands the value for something pretty bad going to happen. Doing research like, I want to uh, do research on new types of XSS vulnerabilities. Nobody cares. But if you can show that these new types of XSS vulnerabilities are applicable to the website that they're working on or the, the uh, application that they're deploying, you have immediate ROI. Sometimes, um, I really can't quantify this number, so I'll just like 60% of the times, uh, security research teams go on a rabbit hole and have no idea how they're going to come out the other end. They might find something or they might not. What often happens is you go one rabbit, uh, rabbit hole, you come out from a different path after finding something else completely, and that's fine for a research team. It's part of the way that they do business. But you as a manager need to be prepared for that and have a plan to, to set in motion once you have those results to show those results and get the buy-in from people above you, sideways you, below you, when you have those results to show that you haven't conducted that research in vain. However, I met many research teams that didn't have that plan ready, so they invested a lot of time, they found something interesting, and now they don't know what to do with it. So now they start shopping around, see, maybe someone can use this, maybe someone can do a tool from it, maybe we can improve a piece of our product that might use this, and then they found out that not, nobody does. Make sure that you have a plan to set in motion once you have something. And if you don't have a plan for that, think very strongly of why don't you have a plan for that. And that comes to the point of, do you really need proof of concepts? Everybody loves POCs, everybody loves building them. This is the closest that most security researchers come to actually building products. In most cases that I've seen, the POC was unneeded. It was even completely unnecessary. 
Because if you can take the same concept, sit with the developer and show him what can be done, you can probably solve that problem right there, right now. Building a POC, you invest two weeks of your life building it, and then you have to demo it around to people to try to understand why it's relevant with what they've built, and it doesn't even overlap with what they've built, instead of just showing them in their code. POCs sometimes are very useful, especially if you need to build a demo or something for management. But if you don't have a very strong reason to do so, skip the POC. Go straight to the source and fix those issues. <clears throat> don't go about any kinds of tangents or weird research paths nobody cares about. Not because you can't or you shouldn't, but because you will lose the trust of your business partners, of your colleagues, very, very fast. Do this from time to time if there's a good compelling reason to do so. But most of the time, you should be going after stuff that's relevant for the business. For some reason, people forget this. Don't just go for bugs. Everybody can find bugs. Fuzzing uh, frameworks find bugs. Take those bugs and find something that really matters, that, that has a root cause that might change a lot of things, that might make security better overall for the product. Security research resources are very expensive. Don't waste them on finding just menial bugs. Focus them on finding important, impactful things for the business. You should also plan for downtimes because sometimes you won't have a new project in the pipeline. So be prepared. Have side projects ready. Maybe something, uh, work on something with lower priority. Maybe uh, something that the entire team can benefit from, like new skills or new technologies. Uh, you can also think about doing uh, bug bounties, responsible disclosure type of things, with the caveat that you have to involve legal because as an employee, you might get into a hairy situation working on other people's products, stuff like that. Still doable, you can still spend some time uh, doing that when you don't have something more pressing to do. One of the most effective things that uh, I've uh, uh, used in order to show the ROI for my teams was alternative costs. If we found that issue, what would have been the cost to fix it? What would have been the cost from man hours? What would the cost from marketing perspective, the damage to the brand? What would be the cost from other uh, uh, waste of resources that might happen? Aggregate that number. Now calculate how much the headcount cost for your team for that period of time and weigh them against the, uh, one another. And often you can show that if you spend a week or two of, re of your team's resources, it's much, much cheaper than have someone else in the wild doing the same thing. You should invest in automation as much as you can, even for security research teams. Getting good practices down, getting good automation down, will free up their time to focus on the important stuff. Try to get as much of the, um, like the black work or the, the dirty work out of their hands and into the hands of automation, because we can, and we really shouldn't do this by hand by now. Over time, after the first time you'll do this calculation, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, you will have a new RI path to show. And that is you're saving the organization money over time. And that is the first issue we found, save the organization $1 million. The second issue, saved $500,000. The third issue, saved $1 million or whatever it is. And then you can put it in a very nice graph. You do it in Excel. Everybody loves Excel in management. You do the graph and you show, over time, we've saved such and such money for the org. It was $10 million from the inception of the team, but $3 million the last year alone. Wow, management love those numbers. You will get support from management much faster when you talk their language, other than saying, we found an RCE, and if somebody else found that RCE, that would have been horrible. They have no idea what it is, even after you explain it. When you give your team uh, goals, or even more than that, when you declare your goals upward in the management chain, be very careful about what you want to measure. Because what you're going to measure, what you're going to optimize for, matters. And when you're uh, deciding on those metrics for your team, which you're going to be measured against, you might make mistakes. A common one that I found is that people give their metric as how many bugs is that my fee, uh, team found over a period of time, or a number of bugs per lines of code we looked at, or 
other kinds of metrics like that. I really, really don't like those metrics. And the reason for it is because you can take a two-week period and find 10 bugs. You can take, take another two-week period and find a single bug. And you can take a four-month period and find no bugs. And all of them would have equivalent value from a business perspective. And if you only measure yourself on the number of bugs, what would happen is that one of your teammates will write a Jira script to file new bugs automatically from the fuzzing uh, framework that you use. And then you have 1,000 new bugs, and the metrics are through the roof, and you flooded the system out and nobody cares anymore. Think very closely about what are your goals, what are your metrics. Sometimes you will have to build a POC to show to upper management to show upper management what you're working on and how much value it has. Sometimes it's something completely stupid. For example, we build a demo that shows that you can uh, upload an image into uh, an image classification machine learning system, and then you change all of the images to, be, uh, to have labels called hacked, hacked, hacked. Stupid, it was really, uh, from a POC perspective, it was like a bash script equivalent of a POC. From management perspective, it was the first time that they actually understood what it means to hack machine learning. So POCs have value if you create them for a very specific purpose. If you just create them to talk to other developers about what's wrong with their code or the security impact that you found, you're doing it wrong. You're going to have to tune your ROI again and again and again because every org is different and rules keeps changing. But you have, as the manager, you have to be on top of that because that's the way that the organization measures you. And as a research team, you're kind of like an outlier for organization. You're not a developer team, you're not a QA team, you're not finance, you're not HR, you're not something that they're used to and they know how to manage and, and measure and budget. You're something that just costs a lot of money and if you're doing your job properly, nothing happens. That's very difficult for finance people, for HR people to measure because impact is not apparent. Think about it all the time. How are you going to visualize? How can you uh, uh, float upward the value of your team? When you're in downtime, excellent time to review everything again. Maybe you can do something differently. Collaborate with your team. They might have better ideas of how to do that. In the end, you get what you measure. And that means that if you measure for the wrong things, you will get the wrong results. It's not easy to measure for the right things, and the goal post keeps changing. But be on top of it and uh, pay close attention. Just a uh, short note on conferences. We're all here right now at conferences, so I'm speaking to the choir here. Everybody here believes that conferences are important. But whenever you have a conversation trying to explain to someone else why going to conferences is important, maybe some of these ideas will help. So the first thing is that if you're a security researcher, going to conferences is part of being a security researcher. You need to have the budget set aside for it and you have to have the goals ready and measured against. If you're not going to do that, it means that you will have troubles hiring talent because you're not doing that and other places are. This is an argument that the HR really likes because it helps them measure themselves against the rest of the industry. Learning, investing in learning for a security researcher is not just easy like getting a Udemy class for the new Node.js framework or something. You don't get security skill set that way. You have to talk to other people, you have to learn from other people. Also, you need your people to be out there and representing your brand, your team, your company, so you will have an easier time to hire other people. I have a letter that uh, I wrote, and uh, I don't have any problem open sourcing it, uh, sending it to my own corporate letter, showing them why I got an ROI from attending and sponsoring conferences. I was trying to hire security researchers for about eight months, zero hires, I couldn't find anyone. I started sponsoring those conferences, giving talks at conferences, getting myself out there and talking about what we do, I got five hires in six months. For me, these are very strong numbers. They are not very different from the other numbers in our industry. So the ROI is very apparent. Okay. So what do you get by attending those conferences? A lot of, on, of, a lot of trainings are only offered on-site. 
workshops, free. Everybody loves free workshops. Also on site, you have to be there to do them. CTFs, a great opportunity to learn, usually on site. Sometimes they're remote, mostly they're not. You can go to the talks. Not a very strong argument because most of them get to, uh, to be available online sometime after the fact. However, going to the underground talks, which is any talk that's not recorded, is probably worth your time and effort to attend that talk. So, for example, I gave a talk about machine learning in numerous places, but I gave one talk about machine learning in a place called Sky Talks in uh, DEF CON. And in that talk, I kind of ripped to shreds many of the machine learning algorithms in the security industry and how they are, uh, for, uh, any, for loss of a better word, lying about their statistics. Yeah, anybody in the business knows that's not true. I just showed the numbers, why they're not true. So a lot of stuff that you can go and see in underground talks, you will not be able to see anywhere else. But the most valuable thing is talking to other people. The amount of ideas, research, opportunities that I found in conferences for my team, for my company, for every position that I've held was extraordinarily valuable compared to the cost of attending that conference. So much so that... I left Intel maybe three months ago, four months ago. I attended the Hacker Summer Camp this Vegas uh, the, a month ago on my own expense because it's worthwhile. And I don't have a stronger argument than that. So I'll skip this one. Also a good uh, thing to share with your team. Uh, this is an important one. So is going to conferences just a fancy bonus, which is a nice picture of Vegas, by the way, from the Bellagio. I don't think so. But if you don't have a clear criteria on who gets to go to the conferences in your team, you can uh, find yourself very, very fast in a place of uh, doing favoritism, nepotism, stuff like that, which brings out bad apples in your team, and you don't want to be there. Have clear criteria. Make sure that people that go share their knowledge. And make sure that you get something out of the process. It might be a hiring pipeline. It might be a blog, social awareness, something. Don't just send people to conferences and that's it. It's a waste of your money. It's a waste of their effort. Make something out of it. Try to plan ahead. What are you going to do? What are you going to spend your budget on? Get a budget for it. Sponsorship opportunities. Giving a conference $1,000 to make sure that they have your logo, your company's logo, is a huge value to get in front of the people you care to be in front of. Uh, I haven't mentioned that, but I am one of the organizers of uh, B-Sides Tel Aviv. It's a relatively uh, large secure conference in Israel, about 1,200 people. And getting an opportunity to just have your logo in front of 1,200 security professionals is probably worth more than $1,000. And this directly affects your hiring pipeline. Uh, in order to get the most value out of this, have a pipeline ready, have a process ready. How are you going to do that? Who do you need to talk to? Who do you need a legal? Who do you need a social? Who holds the keys to the Twitter account? Make sure that you have all of that information in advance. And that brings me to talent. The situation we have today, I don't know how strong you feel it here, but I can tell you definitely how strongly you feel it in Israel, it's a seller's market. Most people can name their price. And more than that, the half-life time of, uh, uh, that the security researcher is looking for a new position is around two weeks. And usually that means that most of them already have a new signed contract in hand by the time that they let you know that they are leaving the, the, the workplace. That means that you don't only have to work fast, you have to be out there with fillers out there to understand when something goes wrong, but also who you're going to hire once someone leaves. If you start right now trying to hire a new person, it might take you months to fill that void. If two persons leave your team, that's a huge void to fill now. So, sourcing. Where can you find that talent? Going to conferences, going to community events, sponsoring events, getting on the right groups, mailing lists, IRC channels, Slack channels, lots of different opportunities. Be out there. Talk to the people who are leaving. Ask them why are they leaving. There are red flags that you should be aware of. If there are... Uh... Something messed up my slides. Okay. Don't leave sourcing for HR. Do this yourself. Work with HR. Um, another note which is very important is that 
what happens in a lot of cases is that you take your best security researcher and you make him a team leader. Most cases, this is the wrong decision. It's the wrong decision because being a manager or a team leader is a different skill set than being a very talented security researcher. That's true for most teams, but even more so for security research teams, because security researchers, if I'll take the, like the, the metaphor for what a security research is, is some introvert working in a basement with a hoodie over his head. That's obviously not true, but for most cases, I think that we can say that we are rugged individuals. We don't work well with teams. We work best alone when we are doing deep dives into technical stuff. It's not really the framework that you would want for a manager. Think about how you separate the two. When people leave you, you should focus your attention about fixing the problems that cause people to leave. In some cases, you won't be able to. For example, a different workplace is offering a lot more money than what we're offering. For example, uh, one of our sites in Israel, while I was at Intel, uh, got a new uh, employer called Amazon which you might have heard of, and they paid between 40 to 60% above market for talent. I can't argue with any person who comes to me and saying, this new place is offering me 60% more on my salary. I'm not trying to argue, I can't, I don't have the tools to do that. But for other cases, maybe you can do something. Someone tells you, look, I'm just, I want a more interesting position, I've been doing the same thing for two, three years. Find them a new thing to do, a new stuff to work on, a different team to transition into. They're an asset to your organization. They already know the organization. Help them stay. Help them make the best of themselves. And if somebody says that I'm leaving because I can't stand that manager, that's a red flag. Research, again, Harvard Business Review has shown that in over 70% of the cases, when people leave their workplace, they don't go because they don't pay enough money. They don't go because the benefits have changed. They go because they don't want to work for that manager anymore. Manager are the number one reason why people leave their workplace. Think of your own personal histories. In how many of those places that you worked at, did you really like your manager, but you decided to leave anyway? Maybe if you were offered a lot more money, Probably not if you offered the same amount of money. You won't leave your current workplace for an added, I don't know, uh, Pop-Tarts or something, or some bonus meals or something. Retaining talent is very difficult. Think about what interests them most and get them what interests them most. I always had some toys lying around. When I say toys, I mean raspberry pies, some uh, pieces of equipment we can play with, some lab that we can work or uh, uh, hassle around with, something we can do. Books, learning. Most of the people I worked with would give a lot to get like, I really wanted this malware research volume number six. That's a benefit that I can give. It's like $100. It's like nothing. But the ratio between the amount of money that it costs you versus the uh, payout in retention is huge. But the single most effective thing that you can do is to get everybody on your team to understand how their specific individual tasks that they're working on are pushing value for the business as a whole. Everybody wants to feel like what they're doing is important, what they're doing has value, and what they're doing is actually moving the needle. They don't want to work in a vacuum. They don't want to be disconnected from the business. And I think more often than not, you will find that most people have a, a very keen sense of what really matters for the business. To wrap this up, I want to talk a bit about what's it like to manage prima donnas. So the first thing is, I know they all met the type, the eccentric, uh, very highly uh, uh, sought after talent that really knows what he wants, but he will not budge a moment to get anything else. So if you can manage that person, immense value. He can, like, he can build everything on his own in the midnight. On the other hand, the cost of managing that person might be too high. It might hurt the entire team when you have such a talent in your midst. So getting that balance is very difficult. On the other hand, if you see such raw talent in one of your juniors, this is something that I would hop on with my bo both of my hands because someone junior versus a senior is much easier to educate, it's much easier to help to get him out of his prima donna uh, position into something that's more team collaborative position. But more than that, when someone is a junior and has so much talent, 
you have time to work with him to still get value from what he does and help him to be a better person, a better teammate. Get help. Your team are your best allies. The community is a great ally. Use them, ask them, ask around. Don't keep those struggles to yourself. You can learn a lot from other people. You yourself can improve a lot by listening to other people. And with that, I want to thank you and open the mic for questions. Are there any questions? Yes. So it very much depends on what you're trying to measure in regards to PR. But uh, one thing that I can uh, tell you that uh, I, we've done something like sentiment analysis before and after we gave the talks to see how people reacted differently to the brand. Also, we talked to the marketing people and told them, you're doing your own surveys. Look at those peaks and see if we got a different uh, perspective, maybe got a different set of data. I'm not sure that's the right thing to measure as a metric for the success of your team, but it might be worthwhile to measure when you're working with their team how your work influences what they do. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, sorry, someone in the back. I'm sorry, one moment, someone with the mic because I can't hear you. I said it's not a question, but thank you for a phenomenal talk. It's probably one of the best talks I've seen on the leadership of security research over the last 10 years. So thank you. Thank you very much. I second that. <laughs>